historic week in politics, with former President Trump appearing in court and two members of the Tennessee state legislature being expelled from office. For more on that, we turn now to the analysis of Capehart and Abernathy. That is Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post, and his fellow Post colleague, Gary Abernathy. David Brooks is away tonight. Welcome to you both. Good Hi, to see you. you. Are these criminal charges going to propel him to the GOP nomination? Yes. Yes. A party that loved the military and, you know, loves, you know, strength. And yet they sided with a guy who attacked a war hero and a former prisoner of war. There's, there's real questions about this indictment, what a high wire act this indictment is. It's kind of, it's very flimsy. This does seem like a rather politicized indictment. Defendant Trump was indicted on 34 felony counts because 16, at least 16 citizens sitting as grand jurors in New York believe there was evidence of probable cause that he committed those 34 felonies. That's why Donald Trump was indicted. There is no, just because a Republican's been indicted, we need to indict a Democrat. That's not the way the rule of law works. He's guaranteed to be top of mind conversation for the next couple of years, not just because he's running for president, but because of these indictments. And frankly, while each one of these involves shameful acts by Trump, no doubt about it, I don't think any of them are probably going to result in, you know, criminal um, um, guilty findings in any case. Everybody seems to agree that there's just, there's not much there. You're taking, for the first time, you're taking what are misdemeanor charges and trying to, as they say, bootstrap them into felonies by someone who campaigned on, hey, I'm the toughest on Trump. Kind of, I'm going to get Trump. That's what seems political about it. There's bigger charges that are out there that somebody could be arrested for. Um, you know, now if one of us probably did it, yeah, I could understand. But somebody at that level of authority like Trump was, um, I, I don't feel like it's, it, it's necessary for that kind of situation. He's a politician. Politicians do bad things. Everybody, you know, has skeletons in their closet. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just bracing myself after after listening to that, oh. um, because especially the, the, the young man who said when you're at that level, you know, maybe this shouldn't happen. This is about accountability. I argue and a lot of other people argue that just because you were a former president of the United States does not give you a pass on following the law. At some point, this man has to be held accountable for things that we saw him do with our own eyes. Gary, this idea we heard from Bobby that at that level it shouldn't happen, that seems yeah. to say people think, well, some people should be above the law. Prosecutors decide all the time, is this a case I can win? And again, legal experts seem kind of across the board to agree, this is a tough one to win. But if I've got a case that most people are saying, there's not much here, you got a question bringing. We have to move on. We're going to be coming back to this for several months, I promise you. <laughs> I do want to ask you about what we just reported on in Tennessee because it was a big and unprecedented move. Republicans in the state house, they're voting to expel two Democratic lawmakers, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, both black men. They voted on a third. Oh, you see there in the middle, Gloria Johnson, who's a white woman, but they did not expel her. Basically said to them, we don't give a damn about you. Those young people came out to their state capitol asking for help days after a school was... Uh, added to the list of schools that have had to suffer mass shootings. They're basically saying to, to Jones and Pearson's constituents, we don't care about you either. Those, those people in their districts have no representative in the state legislature. They, they, don't, they just don't give yeah. a damn about them. When the legislators go down and protest with them, there's a decorum in the House or in any state legislature or in Congress. I don't like it when people shout out during a State of the Union address and, and break that decorum. Uh, you know, you've crossed the line against your fellow legislators in what you're doing. Expulsion. Expulsion, Gary. But to remove them from office, that is, that is so extreme. And we're in a, we are in a time now where some other Republicans in other state legislatures will copy what was done in Tennessee. Yeah. And you know, we've seen this before, though, at the federal level, when the late, now late John Lewis, after a, school, after a mass shooting, went to the well of the House of Representatives, flanked by you know, fellow members of Congress, Democrats, and led a sit-in on the House floor. Mm -hmm. And did the Republican Speaker of the House, I mean, there was a lot of upset. They could have been arrested, mm -hmm. but they weren't. Alex Jones is turning on Trump and Trump supporters. And I have to tell you this broken clocks, you know, the entire thing. Alex Jones analysis of Trump's Tuesday night rant at Mar-a-Lago actually is quite accurately assessing the reality of Trump and his own supporters. Ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah. Okay. Other than this noise, he's making a lot of sense. Thank you. Ooh. That's not the sound I want to hear. But this is one of my big irritants with, with high level Trump supporters. They're in there drinking. It's a big carnival. They love being near the president. They love the fancy, beautiful architecture. Yeah. And they just it's, it's like a beauty pageant or something. Like they feel like they've arrived. I've seen it. I've been around it. And there is just a delirium. And the same thing happened as rallies. Oh, we're invincible. Oh, we can't be stopped. It was just drove me crazy. But sometimes there's two minutes of applause and, and whooping and hollering. And you just it's like they're having fun. This is not fun. <laughs> I've just been around the Trump people and around Trump when there's people around and everybody's like, oh, hi. And I can't believe they're there. No, oh, it's, it's, it's like they're in the cool kid club. And I've been saying that. All right. So I have to tell you, Alex Jones is completely correct. There is a delirium in the room at these events like the one at Mar-a-Lago on Tuesday. The vibe at Mar-a-Lago, we were watching it for like an hour before Trump spoke. We could see what was going on. 
it was like you were there for something positive. And I know some of them are trying to spin it into the indictment is good because it means Trump is going to win. It might help him in the primary. I don't think it helps him with even a single new vote in the general election if he makes it that far. It's cult like. And Alex Jones knows about cults. He's tried to build one. I mean, the Infowars audience is not exactly clear thinking, but he is completely correct that it. it why is there a party atmosphere at Mar-a-Lago? He's been accused of 34 felonies. There are more allegations coming now. I know they just write it off. They say this is all just bogus. But there is a detachment from reality. A delirium really is the, is, is the best word for it that Alex Jones accurately points out. And I I almost think Trump could get sentenced to prison and he would be turning himself over to start his sentence and they would have a party and cheer because somehow some cult leader would tell them this is actually a good thing and I'll tell you why. It's bizarre to see. Let's hope that it leads to their own destruction electorally in 2024. Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida has signed a new law allowing for permitless concealed carry of guns in the state of Florida. The closed door event where he of course signed this into law uh, included only NRA and pro gun lobbyists in the room. Now, uh, meanwhile, Florida Republicans are working on passing legislation that would ban abortion past six weeks because they allegedly want to protect life. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. The new law will allow anyone who can legally own a gun in Florida, which is basically everyone, uh, to carry one without a permit. It means training and a background check will not be required to carry concealed guns in public. It takes effect July 1st. Now again, no license, no training, no background check needed. You just need to be over the age of 21. Nearly 3 million Floridians have a concealed weapons permit. While a background check and three day waiting period will still be required to purchase a gun from a licensed dealer, they are not required for private transactions or exchanges of weapons. So that is the loophole that we oftentimes refer to when we want to close uh, federal back background check loopholes, right? If you're buying from a private seller, you don't have to deal with certain regulations, which is pretty terrible and allows for individuals who have no business carrying weapons, uh, getting their hands on the weapons that they should not be uh, in possession of. Let's make it more unsafe to just live your life. You know, uh, we sh the Stop Woke Act. You know, history is criminalized, but guns are all good. They had a system in place to get the permit if you want to conceal carry in Florida. And no one was complaining about it. This just came out of nowhere, right? Because this is all Republican lawmakers have, right? It's always stuff like this. Anything to make it appear as though they're working real hard for your best interest. When in reality, really, we, we, we want to get rid of the training requirements, the permit requirements for concealed carry in public. But why? It's not difficult to obtain a gun in Florida. No one asked for this. First of all, Ron DeSantis in, in a statement about this legislation said, you don't need a permission slip from the government to be able to exercise your constitutional rights. Okay. Between 2021 and 2022, more than 7,000 Florida residents had a disqualified history. They were denied to carry a concealed weapon, but now the Florida legislature wants to strip away these important provisions. So since they had that permit process in place, over a one year period, 7,000 Florida residents did not qualify for the gun purchase, or at least uh, carrying the gun, uh, a concealed weapon publicly, okay? So now those 7,000 people, if they want to uh, buy a gun now and do the concealed carry, they can do it. There's nothing stopping them. People are gonna die as a result of yes. more people who shouldn't have possession of weapons, easily obtaining the weapons. Because what do the background checks see? They see, oh, you have a history of domestic violence. Oh, you, you know, the cops were called in this instance. Oh, you like went off at somebody, you know, in a store and they called the cops and there was an altercation. Like these are all the things that background checks do. And again, look, if you're a second amendment, you know, diehard, okay, well regulated, mm -hmm. well regulated. I mean, let's put militia aside. I don't know what you do in your private diet, you know, but like, I don't see any militias, really. Are you openly, okay, let's put that aside, well regulated. None of this is well regulated. And Anna, you're right in terms of it's easy to get a gun in Florida. Honestly, it's easy to get a gun even in California. Yeah. You, we talked about the gun show loophole. You just go to a gun show. I remember I went to a gun show, came out, and I see these, hear these two dudes talking, and they like loved it because they were like, you know, they thought it was cool and they liked it. One of them says the other, God, I can't believe you can just buy that. Yeah. Yeah. These are people who like guns. And they were like, I still don't, I don't wow, crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, by the way, it's super easy to purchase a gun in California through the legal channels without having to yeah. take advantage of a gun show loophole. It's not difficult. True. So I just, I don't understand any of this. Now, simultaneously, while the Florida state legislature is passing lax or, or deregulation for their already laxed gun laws, they're also pretending like they care about human lives, which is why they're controlling the bodies of women in their state uh, by out, they're attempting to outlaw abortion past six weeks. A lot of women don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks. It's just too early to know. Victims of rape, incest, and human trafficking, they would have to come forward to the authorities. They would have to have their case adjudicated. No one's gonna do that. So the exceptions are just a weird cover for an incredibly cruel policy that just seeks to punish and control the lives and bodies of women. That is what this is really about. Because if they were genuinely concerned about human lives, Francesca, they wouldn't do away with the permit process to obtain lethal weapons in that same state. You and I haven't spoken, you know, you obviously went viral for your, you know, your very righteous and wonderful rant about, you know, religious fundamentalism in this country. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, and I think you you just said, we've completely jumped the shark on that. Like it's not about your God, your religion. It's not, it's not about that. It is about control. There's no pause button on the uterus while you're, you know, a judge is adjudicating uh, your rape trial. You don't be like, oh, hey, Lil Zygo, could you stop? Because I'm gonna have this unwanted pregnancy just as soon as this judge can, can convict my rapist. 
a year and a half later. Like, come on. You're watching a legal breakdown. So, Glenn, Republican James Comer went on Fox and Friends to state that he took calls from county attorneys in Kentucky and Tennessee who want to go after the Bidens in retaliation for Trump's indictment. Here's that clip. And I'll tell you one of the things that I don't think has been picked up a lot that, that's going to be a problem. And, and I had two calls yesterday, one from a county attorney in Kentucky and one from a county attorney in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. They, they were Republican, obviously. The most states are heavily Republican. They want to know if there are ways they can go after the Bidens now. And they've opened up yep. a can of worms. They set precedents now that we can't go back on. All right, so Glenn, a few questions here. But first, can local officials do this? Like, could we see a wave of prosecution efforts against Democrats? Only if they are corrupt, only if they ignore their oath of office and the, the rules of ethics that guide all attorneys, private attorneys, public attorneys, prosecutors, defense counsel. Um, I mean, this is about as dangerous and frankly, as despicable as it gets from not just my perspective as a former career prosecutor, but I think all honest and ethical attorneys in the practice of law. If this reporting by Comer is accurate, right, and that's a big if, um, for county attorneys, those are prosecutors reportedly in Tennessee and Kentucky saying, you know what, a, uh, a Republican former president has been indicted. Can we go after the Bidens? Can we prosecute the Bidens? Not, we have a suspicion that there may be crime in our jurisdiction and somehow the Bidens may be responsible and we're going to need to open an investigation. No, can we go after the Bidens as naked political retaliation? This is about as dangerous as it gets, Brian. And this really is because the rule of law has sort of laid dormant for so long when it comes to holding accountable um, high government officials who are involved in crime, including members of Congress who committed the crime of, for example, contempt of Congress by violating lawfully issued congressional subpoenas. You know, you reap what you sow. And I think this is why the Comers of the world and the Jim Jordans and the Kevin McCarthy's are, are feeling so emboldened that the rules and the law and, and the ethics of the legal practice just don't matter to them anymore. County attorneys, district attorneys, state's attorneys, commonwealth's attorneys, federal prosecutors, local prosecutors, we are all bound by the rules of ethics of our respective jurisdictions, depending on what state bar we are a member of. So these county attorneys in Tennessee and Kentucky, according to Comer, who want to engage in nakedly sort of political retaliatory prosecutions of Democrats, um, should be investigated. They should be referred to their state bar, write Comer a letter. And I would say, we are insisting that you identify to us the county attorneys that contacted you and said they want to engage in political retaliatory prosecutions because we have opened a bar council investigation. We need to get to the bottom of it because these attorneys may be looking at sanctions. They may be looking at disbarment. This is a gross abuse of position and power by county attorneys. Anybody can make a complaint to bar council. Jim Jordan, who was served a lawfully issued, was a lawfully issued congressional subpoena that required him to appear and testify. When he defied that subpoena, Brian, he committed a crime, a federal crime, contempt of Congress. And because he hasn't been held accountable for that crime, he and his fellow Republicans feel emboldened. They feel unconstrained by the law, by the rules of ethics, by any sort of sense of responsible governing. And that is why we find ourselves where we find ourselves. If you have unethical prosecutors willing to break the law, willing to ignore the ethical rules of their practice. So let's let's operate under that assumption, because we know that Biden has not committed a crime in Kentucky or Tennessee. And so this would like let's let's operate, you know, in this scenario under the assumption that it would be an unethical uh, uh, litigatory effort. Yeah, I mean, they certainly could. I mean, if you have prosecutors that are rogue prosecutors that are willing to open investigations on something other than um, what we call adequate predication, you need enough evidence that one, a crime has been committed. And two, you have some sense of who may have committed it in order to open an, an investigation. Now, if, if these um, if these district attorneys or these county attorneys in Kentucky, in Tennessee, want to just go rogue, well, they could certainly issue subpoenas based on absolutely no evidence. Heck, they could present false testimony to a grand jury. They could secure a conviction of Joe Biden or some other, you know, Democrat. And, uh, you know, and this is what happens if the rule of law is not applied equally. And it hasn't been applied equally. You know, a lot of them are focusing on the fact that Trump was indicted as if it's being done independent of any cause. So just for posterity here, what do you say to those Trump supporters out there who claim that this indictment was unfounded or just the result of some, uh, you know, political effort, some political prosecution? Yeah. Um, defendant Trump was indicted on 34 felony counts because 16, at least 16 citizens sitting as grand jurors in New York believe there was evidence of probable cause that he committed those 34 felonies. That's why Donald Trump was indicted. There is no just because a Republican's been indicted, we need to indict a Democrat. That's not the way the rule of law works. And let's take a step back, Brian. Let's remember members of the judiciary, an independent and co-equal branch of government, have said Donald Trump committed crimes. You have a federal judge in California who made a finding by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. That's a higher evidentiary standard than is required to arrest or indict someone. Judge David Carter found that Donald Trump committed two 
federal felonies, a conspiracy to defraud the United States and obstructing a congressional proceeding. So these, and I, I understand, I don't mean to mix criminal apples and oranges, federal crimes of Donald Trump and state crimes of Donald Trump. The reality is he has committed both. A grand jury in New York found there was probable cause to believe he committed crimes. A federal judge in California found there was a preponderance of the evidence that he committed crimes. So these determinations to indict people are not divorced from evidence. Yeah, I think that's that's perfectly put. So let me let me ask you, what do you think are the political implications of what you know feels like some runaway rogue Republicans now trying to gin up charges against the Bidens? Yeah, I think that if these Republicans think that this is in any way going to redound to their benefit, they're just completely they've completely lost the plot. If if you look and see where the priorities of you know a lot of these uh, Democrats who are in office right now, they are to help the people that actually elected them. And look look what's happening in Wisconsin right now. Democrats just won this state Supreme Court race, and that's going to allow them to finally overturn that 1849 abortion ban. It's going to allow them to fix those completely gerrymandered maps. You look what's happening in Michigan right now, where they just overturned, uh, repealed this 1931 abortion ban. Uh, and they've also eliminated the right to work laws. You look in California, they're, they're going to manufacture insulin at the state level. So you have all of these legislators on the Democratic side who are doing things to actually serve the constituents who elected them. And yet still on the Republican side, all of their efforts, all of their time and energy is going toward saving their dear leader, Donald Trump. And I think that there, there's going to come a point when I don't know how many times the voters have to tell them like they did in 2018, in 2020, in 2022, that this guy is an albatross around their necks and they keep they keep stepping on rakes in order to help Donald Trump. And uh, and and all the while, they're just losing more and more voters. And that's not to say that there are, you know, that this is completely, there, there are plenty of Trump supporters out there, but by and large, you know, especially if you want to reach these voters in swing states, Republicans have pretty much allowed them to fall by the wayside because they're showing constantly that they don't care about doing anything in government other than just, you know, sticking out their necks for Donald Trump. And meanwhile, you've got Democrats delivering in swing states across the country. You've got Democrats delivering in blue states across the country. You've got Democrats electing people in states that Democrats have no right to be elected in because they're seeing that when you just run these extremists, run these people whose entire identity is predicated on the whole MAGA agenda, that it's the voters who aren't buying it. And so, look, you'll have these James Comers who are going to go on because they want to, uh, you know, uh, appeal to the to the. Fox and Friends viewership, the base, but the more you appeal just to the base, the more you are separating yourselves from those regular voters out there whose entire whose entire day is not predicated on what Donald Trump is feeling at that moment. And so, uh, look, you know, we've said it before and I'll say it again, don't interrupt your enemy while he's making a mistake. But, you know, if, Jim, if James Comer wants to come on, if any of these people want to come on and, and uh, just overtly say how they're going to abuse the judicial system all in deference to Donald Trump, more power to him. It's not going to go anywhere, but, but what it is going to do is push all those voters that they need to get away. Well, let me say, Brian, I appreciate that. You know, I'm always bringing the gloom and doom and I'm talking about the erosion of the rule of law and how we're in such deep trouble. I'm glad you can refocus on some of the, the, the accomplishments across the nation of the Democrats, because I don't think we, we focus on that enough. We're always focused on the damage that the Republicans are doing to, to the rule of law. Um, and so it, it is good to remind everybody about um, all of the positive uh, things that are being accomplished by Democrats. You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So, Glenn, the House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan has issued his first subpoena in its investigation into District Attorney Alvin Bragg uh, over his indictment of Trump. Now, District Attorney Bragg has pushed back, making it pretty clear that his office isn't willing to play ball here, isn't going to cooperate with uh, with this federal investigation. Knowing that Jim Jordan is trying to use the federal government to interfere with a state prosecution, is he getting himself into any legal jeopardy here, any legal trouble here? Brian, he is. And the district attorney in New York has told him so. And when you say he's interfering in a state court prosecution, that's not just your assessment. That's not just my assessment. That is precisely what the, what the prosecutors in New York have told Jim Jordan. Let me just quote three things that they said to Jim Jordan in response to his ongoing attempt to interfere in a state court prosecution of Donald Trump. They said, one, you are, quote, interfering in an ongoing criminal matter in state court. Number two, you are engaged in an unprecedented campaign of harassment and, and intimidation. And number three, we urge you to stop your, quote, unlawful political interference. You know, them's fighting words. When a prosecutor tells you that is what you are doing, you know, Brian, that violates New York state law. Let me read from it really briefly. It is that the New York state law is called obstructing governmental administration. And it says that when a person prevents or attempts to prevent a public servant from performing official functions by means of intimidation, physical force, or interference, you have violated that New York state law. Make no mistake about it. This is Alvin Bragg telling Jim Jordan, look sport, you violated New York state law. Really the only open question is, is what does Alvin Bragg do with that now? 